It is uh, wonderful to see all of you here, and it's such a privilege to be standing before you as Dean of the University of Virginia Law School. I'm here today for the same reason that you all are here, I think. I love this law school. I love the students, the faculty, the staff, and I especially love our alumni and the fact that you all are here and that when your student days are behind you, the law school remains a meaningful presence in your life. Uh, and I'm happy to share some of what has been happening at the law school lately and what continues to make this place so special, how we continue to educate students uh, who will be the next generation of lawyers and leaders in our profession, our commonwealth, and our nation, lawyers and leaders like all of you, uh, and how we continue to be, I think, in so many ways, the same law school you will remember, except, I hope, better, uh, to the extent that's possible. So first, here's how we do it. We take top-notch students who are diverse in every way, in their backgrounds, their experiences, their views, attitudes, politics, interests, hopes, and dreams, and we provide access to the law school and the legal profession for everyone who has the talent and drive to join us. Our applications are up this year 11%, uh, and our new class is shaping up beautifully, and your support allows us to award a record number of full tuition scholarships to the current first year class, and I anticipate the incoming one as well. One big change, I was thinking this uh, as we were talking about the highest numbers of donors in the various classes. So one change that uh, Dean Mahoney initiated uh, that we have now reached steady state is uh, the gradual lowering of our class size to bring ourselves a little bit more into uh, uh, a relation to our closest peers. We're still on the larger size, uh, but a little closer. So we are now at our steady state of around 300 students per class. So those of you in the larger classes will know that's a, a, a reduction. It enables us to keep the quality of our classes, uh, of our students high, and to provide the best possible employment outcomes for them, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And it also enables us to improve our education uh, as the nature and expectations for legal education change over time as well. I am often asked by other deans how we are able to do this to operate on 20% less tuition revenue. Uh, and the answer is all of you. The answer is the generosity of our alumni and the people who love this school, as well as the incredible stewardship by the Law School Foundation of our endowment. So we take the best and the brightest who are diverse in a wide array uh, of ways, and we bring them here and we build a community together a collegial, collaborative community that is simultaneously intellectually challenging and committed to the free exchange of ideas. We are among the po most politically, ideologically, and methodologically diverse faculties and uh, student groups of all uh, our peer law schools. Uh, and that can, in some places, that kind of uh, political diversity can in some places lead to balkanization, to silos, to conflict. But because we combine it here with our deep commitment to collegiality and community, to supporting one another, it is a gift and a boon and something that makes this place so special. Pluralism and collegiality mean that we are engaged. We do not take that for granted and we are always looking for ways to enhance our community and ensure the free exchange of ideas. There's a new student and faculty organization uh, that started two years ago called Common Law Grounds, uh, which was created to provide a place to have political discourse uh, across differing viewpoints. There are many other ways in which we do that, but I'll move on. Uh, we have such a vibrant community. Last year, our students hosted nearly 250 speakers over the course of the academic year. That included uh, sitting judges, practitioners in government, public interest, and private firms, as well as industry leaders from a wide range of industries. Uh, two, I just want to mention, US Supreme Court Justice Breyer uh, came and spoke to our students, and US Federal Judge Frank Easterbrook came and served as our Jefferson Medalist last year. There are too many student honors to list here, but I want to mention just two. The first is that our Black Law Students Association won National Chapter of the Year last year for the second year in a row, and for the fifth time since 2002. They are just providing remarkable <laughs> leadership. Uh, 
Uh, the second is uh, to mention a group of our students who complete, competed in Belgium this past spring at the International and European Tax Moot Court competition uh, under the guidance of Professor Ruth Mason. This was the first time uh, a group from a United States law school won this competition ever, and it was only the second time we had competed. It was a real uh, triumph of our students and their faculty advisor. Um, <laughs> One other uh, thing to mention, and then someone I would like to recognize. We uh, commemorated this spring Gregory Swanson, who was the first African-American student to integrate the law school, the university, and in fact, any institution of higher education in the South in 1950. There is a new portrait of Gregory Swanson in the library, and we awarded uh, an inaugural Gregory Swanson Award to two students uh, who embody his courage perseverance and commitment to justice. Uh, we awarded that earlier this year as well. I am so honored to welcome back to the law school Mr. John Merchant, who was the first African-American graduate of this law school, who graduated in 1958. He is here for his 60th reunion. He was kind enough to make time to come here this morning amidst many interviews and oral histories and other commemorations. And I hope you will all please join me in a round of applause for Mr. Merchant's achievement and the legacy of African-American students and alumni who have followed in his footsteps. The law school Mr. Swanson and Mr. Merchant helped to create is one committed to joy, humanity, respect, dialogue, collaboration, and community across so many of our differences. We leave here friends, colleagues, and future networks and relationships that our students will cherish forever. And watching all of you reconnect with your classmates and meet new classmates is a testament to that community. So within this vibrant community, we teach and learn and serve together. Our curriculum is more extensive and more varied than ever and enhanced and facilitated by our smaller class size. In addition to our fundamental basic black letter law classes, which are now taught in smaller classes than many of you would recall, we offer a broad range of small seminars engaging extra legal and interdisciplinary perspectives and also an intense and expansive experiential learning curriculum that is faculty intensive with skills classes, simulations, externships, and especially clinics. In 2000, we had five clinics, and we now have 18 clinics. This curriculum is taught by a faculty deeply committed to teaching and the success of our students. And they share with the students and model for them open and supportive intellectual discourse. They also bring to their teaching their own in-depth expertise from their research, their practice, and their leadership of the profession and our nation. We are number three in the number of professors among the top 100 faculty in the country cited by the judiciary. That means the work of our faculty is very, very relevant. Between the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic and our own faculty arguments, the law school tied for second in the number of lawyers from any single organization, be it a law school, a law firm, a nonprofit, arguing before the court this term. This is very rarefied air. The law school is consistently among the top litigators to appear before the court. Four faculty were elected to the American Law Institute this year. Leslie Kendrick, our vice dean, who I'll speak more about in a minute. Julia Mahoney, Sai Prakash, and myself. We now have 25 total members of our faculty who are members of the American Law Institute. I was also elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences this year, which makes eight Academy Fellows in our faculty, uh, on our faculty in total. I can't even begin to speak to you all of the prestigious fellowships, book prizes, teaching awards, appointments to committees of national appoint uh, importance on things like opioid addiction and policing that our faculty won this year. All of the work of our faculty is intended to expand our knowledge about the law and to make our laws and our legal system better. In fact, our faculty are so productive, I seem to be running out of research chairs that we need to support them. 
hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> Our faculty are not only amazing teachers and productive scholars, they are also leaders both within the university and beyond. You've already heard about former Dean John Jeffries, uh, who won UVA's Jefferson Award for Scholarship in the fall, the, uh, the highest honor we give inside the university, uh, who will be leading UVA's advancement efforts, and of course, Jim Ryan, our new president. Uh, I wanted to mention three others in addition. So Leslie Kendrick began serving as vice dean last summer. She is a Moorhead scholar from UNC, a Rhodes scholar, a 2006 graduate of the law school who won virtually every award she could at graduation. She clerked for Judge Harvey Wilkinson and Justice David Souter. She is an expert in free speech, torts, property, and constitutional law, and she won the All University Teaching Award of last year. You will see more of her in a minute as she'll be moderating our dean's panel. Toby Heightens, a member of our faculty and class of 2000, was named Solicitor General of Virginia and is on leave from the law school for the next two years for that appointment. And finally, our Professor Carrie Abrams will be leaving us to become the dean of Duke Law School as it's uh, uh, it, this summer. That makes four current or former female faculty members of this law school deans of top law schools. So in addition, <laughs> I think we pride ourselves on uh, training and educating leaders among our students, but it is also clear that our unique institutional culture uh, facilitates leadership among our faculty as well. Okay, so here's where we stand. We take the best and the brightest students, we create supportive, challenging, and vibrant community with them, and we teach and learn with field-changing faculty and leaders across a broad and deep curriculum. And then, and finally, we do everything in our power to make the hopes and dreams of our students come true. I really have only one main point here, but there'll be a few subpoints. We are excelling in every type of post-graduation employment, and that is not true at very many schools. The most common three types of employment that our graduates enter is private practice, clerkships, and public service. We are also increasingly sending our students directly into business, uh, but I want to talk about those three most common for a moment. On the private side, we have five full-time professional staff, and we have a 97% overall employment rate. We also have a 99.44% ultimate bar passage rate. <laughs> We make every effort to ensure that our students who want to go to smaller firms and smaller markets and high-end boutiques and leaders in smaller mid-sized cities can do so. And we also make sure that those of our students who are a majority who want to go into big law can do that too. In the class of 2017, we sent our graduates to 30 states, the District of Columbia, and four foreign countries. That's a pretty wide variety of hopes and dreams. It is also the case that 79% of the class of 2017 went to what we call elite jobs, firms of 100 plus lawyers as well as federal clerkship. We rank fourth in the country on that metric. We are third in the country in the percentage of our class who went directly to firms of 100 or more, and fourth in the National Law Journal's go-to law school's rankings. These are simply stupendous numbers. One way that we keep ourselves accountable to our students when it comes to debt, which is a real and important concern, is by measuring the first year salaries of our graduates. For those entering private practice in the class of 2017, everyone all the way down to the 25th percentile of our class has an, out, uh, an opening salary of $180,000. For the second straight year, that is the case. Many of those, of course, who are going to federal clerkships will also go into jobs paying that much, as well as getting a healthy clerkship bonus. Our 25th percentile for the class of 2017 overall, so that is not only those going into private practice, but all of our class, moved this year from around $66,500 to $110,000. So 110 for all of our students uh, uh, is the 25th percentile for our class. So debt is real, and it's an important concern, but it is clearly sustainable at these salary levels uh, for our students. 
It is not just our students' immediate post-graduation outcomes that are excellent, but also their long-term career prospects. Two examples of that success from recent studies are that we are number two in our graduates who are leading top 100 law firms, and we are number two in the number of chief legal, offices, law, legal officers at top 500 companies. That's you all. Okay. Uh, on the clerkship front, we have 81 known alumni set to clerk this fall, 36 of whom are at the Federal Courts of Appeal, which is tied with last year for the highest number ever. And we are, over the period from 2008 to 2017, fourth in Supreme Court placements after only Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. On the public service side, more and more of our students are coming here precisely because of the public, support, public service support that we offer and intent upon and then actually entering public service immediately upon graduation. We had a Skadden Fellow this year as well as a DeRote Fellow at the Alliance for Justice. And we have really come to a place of maturity uh, that both Deans Mahoney and Dean Jeffries uh, began us on the path of, of a real classroom to career public service program. Providing support everywhere from full tuition scholarships at the front end to incoming students, three career counselors in the Mortimer Kaplan Public Service Center, a travel fund program to help students afford the cost of traveling to public service interviews, mentoring and dedicated courses through the program in law and public service that Jim Ryan created. We now have a full-time director, Crystal Shin, from the class of 2010. An annual conference, guaranteed funding for eligible students for summer public service work, public service fellowships post-graduation for our students to directly enter public service uh, jobs, loan forgiveness where we pay back the loans of our students in public service work as well as in underserved communities in Virginia, and alumni career counseling where we have counseled close to 200 alumni interested in making the transition to public service since expanding our counseling just a year and a half ago. So I hope you see we are thriving, excelling, and setting the course and the standard. But don't just take it from me. I have a few numbers that you might enjoy hearing that you could bring back with you about your alma mater. These are from a Princeton Review survey of current law students. This ranks us as number one for best professors in the country, number one for best quality of life, number two for best classroom experience. So far as I can tell, the difference between best professors and best classroom experience has to be something about temperature control in the classrooms, but I don't know. We're working on it. Um, and number six for best career prospects. We are the only law school to rank in the top 10 on all four of those important metrics. I will not rehearse the incredible numbers that Lou already talked about, but let me just say that it is your support and generosity that makes it possible for us to do all of this. And in the end, our students become leaders in every realm. They become you. So if you are energized and excited right now about all that we're doing, I am clearly right there with you. The law school has never been more itself. Vibrant, collegial, exceptional, and transformative. And I am looking forward to continuing that into our third century. Our third century. Last October 6th was the bicentennial of the laying of the cornerstone of Pavilion 7. When that cornerstone was laid in 1817, the nation's third, fourth, and fifth presidents, I won't quiz you, Jefferson, M Madison, and Monroe were all present. So that made 200 years from the beginning of the building of this university. We began our bicentennial celebrations then, and we will continue them throughout the next few years, celebrating our entire history and looking forward to the third century. In 2019, will be the university's charter bicentennial, and then 2025 and 2026, we will celebrate the beginning of the bicentennial of our first classes. It's quite a moment. A new president, a new century, a new capital campaign. <laughs> I want to share with you an extraordinary gift that many of you have already heard about that will kick off that campaign. Martha and Bruce Karsh of the classes of 81 and 80, respectively, met here at the law school as students. They have been longtime friends and generous donors to the law school. They have just announced a gift of $44 million, which includes matching funds from the Board of Visitors. It will go for scholarships, professorships, and a new Karsh Center for Law and Democracy. 
This is the largest cash gift in the history of the law school, and it makes the Karshes the first $50 million lifetime donors to the law school. This gift is an extraordinary testament of faith and confidence in the law school and its future. You heard Lou say in his report that our alumni giving rate was 53% last year, our 12th year in a row of over 50%. This is unheard of, especially among law schools, and it is the envy of our peers. Even better is that in our last capital campaign from 2004 to 2012, 72% of our alumni made a gift. 72%. That is a level of participation that sets us apart, and it is the kind of support that Martha and Bruce Karsh want to inspire in the Third Century Campaign. I look forward to it, and I hope you will join them and us. Let's set that aside for now, as today we are here to reconnect with old friends, celebrate each other and our law school, and enjoy ourselves. Your love for this institution and for each other is legal, it, it le is legion, sorry, of course it's legal too, it is legion, and it is crucial, and I just want to thank you for that and for making all of this possible. It is now my honor to offer a tribute to Kent Sinclair a member of our faculty retiring this year. Kent Sinclair joined the UVA law faculty 35 years ago in 1983. He and his wife Katie, who is here today as well, moved here from New York, leaving behind a job that many lawyers think of as a pinnacle. Kent had for seven years been a magistrate judge in the Southern District of New York. He holds an AB from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a JD from the University of California at Berkeley, where he was chief notes and comments editor for the California Law Review and the champion of their moot court competition. When he first joined our faculty, Kent taught courses on civil procedure and evidence, a perfect fit for a former magistrate judge. Over the past 35 years, Kent has been a quiet and very effective change agent for the law. He takes the long view and sees the value of incremental reform. At the law school, he served as associate dean from 1989 to 1994, and for many years, he has chaired the law school's adjunct instructor, com instructor committee, which oversees the selection and hiring of hundreds of adjunct faculty. This is a huge, complex job, and he has left very large shoes to fill. Uh, Vice Dean Kendrick and I spend quite a lot of time talking about who and how we are going to fill those shoes. Perhaps more important, Kent's efforts over the years have left an indelible mark on the presence of our clinics and practical learning components of our curriculum. With former Professor Rich Balnave, Kent helped bring experiential learning into our classrooms. 35 years ago, I said in 2000 there were five clinics. 35 years ago, there was just one, the criminal defense clinic, which he oversaw. He worked with the local bar to find ways our students could get practical experience. As I said, we now offer 18 clinics and over 55 professional skills courses. Kent's reach is not limited to the confines of Withers Brown and Slaughter Halls. Over the course of his career, he has become a leading authority on practice and procedure, particularly in the Commonwealth. Anyone here in the audience who practices in Virginia has no doubt consulted one of his many publications, such as Virginia Civil Procedure, The Law of Evidence of Virginia, or The Trial Handbook. Likely, those of you practicing in trial court, in federal court, have also heard of Kent Sinclair. Charles Allen Wright of Wright and Miller's Federal Practice referred to Kent as our leading scholar on service of process. By one count, he has been cited 141 times in Virginia court opinions. Kent recognized early on that alternative dispute resolution would serve many potential litigants as well, and he worked with Rich Balnave to expand alternative dispute resolution options in Virginia. They ran a service to help communities set up local mediation centers, and for six years, he served on the Virginia State Bar's Task Force on Alternative Dispute Resolution, which developed statutes that made it easier for parties to seek remedies outside of litigation. 
Kent was also instrumental to Virginia civil litigation reform. He was appointed chair of the Virginia Supreme Court's Advisory Committee on Rules. Some of you may remember the days when Virginia had separate law and equity systems. Over the course of 20 years, you heard me talk about incremental and slow. It was not his fault. Over the course of 20 years, a few rolls at a time, and changing over 40 implicated statutes, he helped convert these separate systems for civil disputes into a single form for civil actions. He was also involved in another 20-year effort to transform the Virginia rules of evidence. And since 1984, he has been the reporter for, of decisions for the G Virginia Supreme Court, including project reporter for the Virginia Model Jury Instructions Project and editor-in-chief of the Virginia Model Jury Instructions for both the criminal and the civil side. His career also includes services as a court appointed, uh, served as special master in four cases involving hundreds of decisions. He is the founding director and has served as a lecturer for the Virginia Judicial Institute from 1985 to 2009. And he is a life member of the American Law Institute. Kent does not plan to rest on his laurels in retirement. He will continue to update his many publications and will continue to work to improve the profession of law through the Rules Committee and the Virginia Supreme Court's Model Jury Instructions Committee. This is hardly a surprise. A professional lifetime rationalizing and streamlining the law is a hard habit to kick. Lucky for all of us, the Commonwealth and beyond, Kent has no intention of doing so. I have a token of appreciation and something for Kent to use to celebrate his new adventure. Please join me in honoring Kent Sinclair. That introduction was so nice, I thought maybe I had died and this was the, uh, <laughs> the requiem. Uh, it's very important for me to be in front of this distinguished group of alumni to put a bookend on my career. Of all the fabulous things which the dean was kind enough to say, what you don't know is that other alumni like you shaped my career in the law. I went to work for a very large law firm in New York and Bob Knight, whose name is on a classroom in the other building, was the head of the firm. My very first day in practice on Wall Street, my office mate was assigned, J. Kermit Birchfield, the class of 71, whom some of you know. And for all my time at the law firm, I was supervised and litigated numerous cases with W. Foster Wolin, the class of 1961, maybe. Uh, so when 13 years later, Lisa Merrill's husband called me and invited me to come down to talk to the law school. I knew the kind of standards which this law school wanted to inculcate, and I was happy to try to take on a role uh, in helping to do that. I also want to take one more moment of your time because at my time at the law school, in addition to teaching, I have also, uh, as the dean mentioned, had the opportunity to work with our adjunct program where distinguished Members of the bar, including some that are in this room, have returned to the law school to teach adjunct classes on special uh, materials. And all of the living deans uh, who are going to be on the panel in a few moments, I worked with closely in trying to bring that bridge between the expertise of the practicing bar and the academic mission of this law school to try to work on the nuts and bolts of the curriculum of this excellent institution. And I wanted to thank all five of them, and I'm glad that they're all here today so I can do it in person. Thank you. Another faculty member uh, we recognize this morning, and I'm sad to say not on the occasion of his retirement, uh, but on the occasion of his passing, is J. Gordon Hilton, a.k.a. Give Him Hell Gordon, I have learned, who passed away earlier this month. Gordon's research interests focused on the history of the legal profession, the history of civil rights, 
and the legal history of American sports. Gordon found joy in teaching, and he especially loved teaching first-year students their first semester in law school. Some might see the combination of civil rights, the legal profession, and sports as a rather unusual portfolio. For him, I think, it was the trifecta of scholarly pursuits, and I would like to think he was particularly happy to pursue those interests here at his alma mater. Gordon was a member of the class of 1977, and he was also one of the first to participate in our JD Masters in History joint degree program. He had previously earned his bachelor's degree from Oberlin College, where he majored in history and English and played baseball for the yeoman. Following law school, he earned his PhD in history of American civilization from Harvard, where he received one of many awards for teaching and mentorship and started to develop his legendary passion for teaching. Gordon began his career as a law professor at Illinois Institute of Technology's Chicago Kent School of Law, where he won numerous teaching awards. In 1995, he joined the faculty at Marquette, where he had a 20-year distinguished teaching career, and he received many teaching awards there as well. The teaching award that I think is uh, the key to understanding how exceptional he was is that as a visiting professor at Washington University in St. Louis, he was named Professor of the Year. No other visiting professor <laughs> holds that distinction. That is a coup. He returned home to Virginia, first as a part-time visitor starting in 2009, and then as a full-time member of the faculty three years ago. Professor Kim Ford Mesrui, a friend and colleague, has noted, Gordon was intellectually curious and committed to getting the facts and history right, no matter their complexity or controversial nature. This characteristic, quote, commitment to learn and understand the truth, close quote, as Professor Edward Fallone of Marquette also noted, were on full display this past year when we honored Gregory Swanson. There were many stories and myths about Mr. Swanson's time here that had passed down from generation to generation, and Gordon's exhaustive research helped clarify and examine Swanson's legacy and deepened our knowledge of the law school and of the university that Mr. Swanson desegregated. Gordon's intellectual curiosity also had a lighter side. He had a true knack for trivia, so much so that he served as a designated phone a friend lifeline in the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire game show four different times. <laughs> that lighter side was also <clears throat> manifest in his quick wit. When he campaigned for the Oberlin Student Senate, the candidates were given the opportunity to provide a statement to the student paper. You can imagine how lengthy some of those statements were. Uh, Gordon's statement was the following sentence, one sentence. I think that the Student Senate should do as little as necessary. <laughs> While so much of Gordon's career was defined as a teacher, historian, and scholar, he had a particular love of sports. Who else could eagerly author not only a book on sports law and regulation, but analyses of, these are titles, how FIFA used the principle of autonomy of sport to shield corruption in the Sepp Blatter era? and how the morals clause in Jack Molinas' contract saved the National Basketball Association in 1954. <laughs> there are more, I won't continue. Uh, Gordon particularly loved organized baseball, not just for the sport, which I'll get back to softball in a minute, but because he saw it as a microcosm of the legal system. Statutes, a rule book, statutory interpretations, judicial figures in umpires, contracts, unwritten rules. He once noted, following baseball from a legal perspective is like taking a course in comparative law. Gordon's interest in sports went beyond the academic. One of his most favorite and cherished spots in town was the softball field across the street from the law school. And the reason is, it was where he and his fellow classmates started, started the North Ground Softball League, now heading into its 42nd year of play. As a member of the class of 1977, Gordon was part of the first 1L class to use the then new law school building here on North Grounds. And across the street, he and his friends noticed the softball field, and they made it their own. Forty years later, as a professor, Gordon delighted in playing in the founding fathers game in which the NGSL originals fielded a team against current students. Gordon's legacy lives on in the flourishing of the NGSL as well as the students he has touched and the legal and historical knowledge he has created through his scholarship. Gordon lives on as well through his family and friends. He loved his family dear dearly, 
And we can all take comfort in knowing that his children were with him in his final days and that it brought him so much joy to participate in his daughter's wedding, to visit with his family, and to speak with some of you, his classmates and friends, near the end of his life. Since Gordon's passing, many colleagues, former classmates, and former students have taken the time to share their memories of Gordon. Refrains of his warmth, his unfailing kindness, and his generosity and mentorship echo throughout these statements. On a personal level, I was privileged to witness frequently, as a fellow legal historian, Gordon's immense stores of knowledge deployed with characteristic generosity and curiosity and to learn so much from him. I wish we had had the opportunity to celebrate Gordon when he could have heard the beautiful sentiments of affection, respect, and admiration that have followed his passing. I think he would have been touched. I know I have been. I want to close with something Randy Flaherty, our special collections librarian here at the law school, said about Gordon as they worked together to decipher Swanson's legacy. She reflected, working with Gordon cemented for me that there are no throwaway sentences when you are writing history. Every piece of information or interpretation you present is a claim about someone's life, a real person's life, and there is responsibility there to get it right. I hope we got it right today. Gordon was a wonderful friend and colleague, and he will be missed. I have one more tribute before we turn to the Dean's panel. When we first conceived of the idea of a Dean's panel, I had hoped that Dick Merrill would be able to participate as the seventh dean of the law school from 1980 to 1988, and a member of the law school faculty for 38 years from 1969 to 2007. I wish that had been the case, and I'm so glad that Lissa Merrill is here today. I'm glad also that so many who knew, loved, and respected Dick were able to celebrate him at a memorial service here in January. Let me just pause for a moment, is that okay? and say there will be a memorial service, I should have said this a minute ago, there will be a memorial service for Gordon uh, at the Darden Abbott Dining Room uh, at 3.30 this afternoon, uh, and everyone is invited to attend. I'm sorry I didn't say that before. Um, I hope this tribute to Dick both serves to honor him as he deserves to be honored, and also to make him part of the conversation that follows, a conversation about how the deans of this law school have shaped it over the past four decades, and how the school has both maintained its excellence and identity and grown and changed over that time. So I want to talk first about uh, Dick's career as a whole, and then talk uh, a bit about his time here as dean and, and his accomplishments there. Dick attended Columbia University, uh, where he graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa, studying history, served as a Rhodes Scholar, and then graduated from Columbia Law School, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Columbia Law Review. Following graduation, he clerked for Judge Carl McGowan on the DC Court of Appeals, and then joined Covington and Burling, where he practiced for four years. He joined the law faculty in 1969, served as associate dean from 1974 to 1975, when uh, the law school moved from Clark Hall to North Grounds, when Gordon Hilton was a student. From 1976 to 1978, he served as chief counsel to the US Food and Drug Administration, overseeing an office of more than 30 lawyers and on sabbatical from the law school. While there, he was awarded the FDA Commissioner's Special Citation and the agency's Award of Merit. He was appointed dean shortly after he returned to the law school, and after his tenure as dean, he returned full time to teaching and research. He was a scholar, expert, and teacher of administrative, environmental, food and drug, and Native American law. He later returned to Covington and Burling as a special counsel consulting on food and drug and other regulatory matters. Dick was, the first, was among the first lawyers to be invited to join the National Academy of Sciences. He was active there in the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, the Board of Envi on Environmental Sciences and Toxicology, and the Committee on Science, Technology, and Law. He also served on the boards of the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, the Food and Drug Law Institute, the Southern Environmental Law Center, and the Environmental Law Institute. It was an incredible career. The imprint that Dick made on this law school as dean is everywhere around us, making possible so much of our sustained excellence for the past 30 years. Dick put his intellect, his creativity, and what some have called his quiet resolution 
to the law school's great advantage, and he lay the path for where we are now. When we laud our self-sufficiency, the strength of our endowment, our extraordinary faculty, and our diverse curriculum, we owe acknowledgement and praise to Dick Merrill, who has been called a genuine visionary. Dick increased the endowment of the law school over his time from $7 million to $26 million. Uh, that is just an incredible increase. Uh, as former faculty member and associate dean Liz McGill said, quote, he brought UVA law into an entirely new place from the perspective of financial support from alums, a model followed by every public school that could. He, endowed, he created endowed rotating faculty research chairs, those are the ones I mentioned earlier, to encourage and support advanced scholarship, which John Jeffries has aptly called a brilliant innovation. Dick was an early and strong proponent of interdisciplinary studies in legal education, and some notable faculty hires, in addition to Ken Sinclair during his tenure, were Ken Abraham, Alex Johnson, Pam Carlin, Saul Levmore, and Mildred Robinson. Mike Dooley, a late faculty member, said, quote, under Dick's leadership, the law school achieved our ambition to join and perhaps lead that handful of institutions that will set the standards for legal education and scholarship in our time. Dick very much enjoyed his visits with alumni, and I think he would have enjoyed this weekend a lot. We, um, in his 2007 uh, news story about his retirement from the law school, uh, this is a quote from the story, one of Merrill's favorite duties as dean was visiting and communicating with alumni. Quote, we have an unusual, generous, and enthusiastic committed group of graduates, he said. They rarely complained, and quote, that can't be said for any other constituency you deal with when you're dean, <laughs> he said with a smile. Dick accomplished so much and exercised such influential leadership through, as one obituary put it, his compassion, quiet resolution, eloquent and fervent advocacy, intellect, and most of all, selfless modesty. He was just, candid, and accessible, always listening with interest and empathy. As John Jeffrey said, Dick was, quote, a gentle leader, meticulously observant to the sensibilities of those around him, unfailingly respectful of their views and contribution, and never in such a rush to the right outcome that he stepped on anyone to get there. Though I have never been accused of being quiet, he is clearly a role model for me in so many ways. I also know how deeply he touched so many of us as lawyer, teacher, colleague, leader, and friend. Liz McGill said, quote, if we are lucky in our professional lives, we meet someone like Dick Merrill, an accomplished professional, professional, a great leader, and a gem of a human being. I count myself triply lucky to have known him as a student, colleague, and friend. There is no one I admired more or learned more from than Dick Merrill. Other former students echo that praise and influence, saying things like, everything I've accomplished in my professional life, I owe to Dick. I know that so many feel the same way, including many in this room. Dick lives on in many of us here, in the law school, in the profession, and especially in this wonderful institution that we inherited from him and that we all love. Thank you.